awesome. Need to key uh, myself and we need to add as well. Awesome. All right. Um, thank you everyone uh, for joining the session today with uh, Stanford um, Blockchain Club. Uh, so my name is Kum. I'm part of the leadership team of Stanford Blockchain Club. Um, and today um, we have Ed Felton, um, co-founder and chief scientist from uh, um, Blockchain Lab, and also um, part of the um, leadership team of uh, Abitron. Um, so I think uh, I'll, to start off, I'll let Ed to do uh, some um, intro. Sure. Yeah, let me introduce myself uh, quickly. Um, but first, let me say, um, you know, I like to have interactive conversations. So uh, please, everybody feel free to speak up. Um, just jump in or uh, write something in the chat if you, uh, uh, if you have a question or uh, you wanna dispute something I'm saying or, or whatever. Um, when I talk about my background, I'll start with having been a professor for quite a while. Um, I taught at Princeton Computer Science um, and then uh, later also in the public policy school. Um, so I did a lot of work in that role in uh, security and privacy, um, but that, then I started working in the blockchain cryptocurrency space around 2012. Started to do some of the early work on um, questions about stability of the um, uh, of proof of work um, mining consensus algorithms and uh, stuff like that. Um, eventually um, became um, uh, put together with some colleagues and friends a uh, Coursera course on um, called Bitcoin and cryptocurrency technologies, which then became a, a textbook that um, has been used quite a bit, although it's now getting a bit out of date. Um, so anyway, as a professor for a long time, um, started in 2014, um, early in 2014 is when the idea for Arbitrum, and I'll talk a, a little bit later about what that is, um, came along. Um, started working on that. Um, a bunch of students at Princeton built the first version of Arbitrum, Proto Arbitrum, as, um, as a course project in the fall 2014 semester. Uh, you can actually go um, on to YouTube, and if you Google Arbitrum student presentation or something like that, you should be able to find it. Um, and the core ideas of Arbitrum were there already at that time. Um, so um, they did that in the beginning of 2015. Um, in April of 2015, I had this um, unusual career change situation, which is I got invited to join the White House staff. And so I served for about two years as um, deputy CTO of the United States and a senior advisor to then President Obama, which was an incredible experience, but um, didn't get a lot of time to work on Arbitrum during that time, which by which I mean um, no time at all. So um, January 20th of 2017, they kicked all of us out the door. I went back to Princeton and um, maybe a few weeks later, a couple of grads, then grad students, Harry Kladner and Stephen Goldfeder are coming to my office and they say, hey, remember that Arbitrum thing you worked on before you left? Let's do that again. So we picked it up and started working on it, building an academic prototype of Arbitrum. And that eventually became a paper that we published in the USENIX Security Symposium in um, August of 2018. And at that point we realized, hey, we had this thing that solved a problem that was going to become an important problem in the blockchain space, namely how to scale smart contracts up. Um, and we had a solution for that and, and that like it had commercial value. So we started the company um, in basically in late 2018. Um, we became a real company in the sense of having a full-time employee and a, and a seed round of funding in the beginning of 2019. And we kind of built from there. Um, I took it in um, uh, summer 2019, I started taking leaves from my professor role at Princeton. I took leave after leave until they eventually told me that I had to stay or go. And so I said, okay, I'll go. Um, and um, so I've been full-time in the company since basically summer of 2019. Um, and that's now my full-time role. Um, so, so we've grown since then. We released a test net. We released another test net. Last August, we released our main net version of Arbitrum. Um, and we've grown from there. The company has since done two more rounds of funding. We've raised around $125 million total. 
And uh, we now have 30 employees and growing to around 40 over the next month and a half, continuing to grow. So lots of growth and success. We released our mainnet um, Arbitrum, which is a layer two solution, layer two scaling solution on top of Ethereum. So we're the leading layer two um, on Ethereum by almost any measure. Um, so like to give you an idea, um, we have, a, we have a couple hundred thousand monthly, unique monthly users, um, some tens of thousands of smart contracts deployed on the chain. Uh, several hundred um, teams have deployed pro projects of various sorts on Arbitrum, including most of the major DeFi applications from Ethereum, a bunch of NFT environments and others. Um, we have around, I guess, now that Ethereum's value is down, we're, we have, um, a bit under $3 billion of assets on our L2 chain. And um, we're working toward a major, major upgrade of the tech uh, through something we call Arbitrum Nitro. So that was a lot of um, initial talking, but um, that'll give you an idea of both sort of who I am and what our, our company, our project is doing. The company is called Offchain Labs. The product is called Arbitrum. And happy to talk about any of this stuff um, more. So what would be interesting? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ed, for um, the summary of um, like your journey and the company, uh, such an impressive uh, journey um, and also impressive accomplishment. Uh, so as Ed mentioned, uh, he would like to, this session to be more like interactive. So anyone feel free if you have any questions or, or, or if you can talk, um, you can throw a question to chat. And uh, if you can talk, just unmute yourself. So feel free to ask questions. Um, just start off. I think it's very interesting that um, uh, your uh, team or your student um, and you also started kind of this uh, journey or Arbitrum like uh, 2014, right? I think that times even before or right the time where Ethereum was born, right? Before Ethereum, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is what we always tell people, we were, we were designing scaling solution um, for smart contract execution before there were any public chains in sort of on mainnet doing that. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm really curious of uh, back in 2014, like what's the thought back then about yeah. smart contract and what was possible, right? Even before Ethereum. Yeah, so smart contracts, I got super excited about smart contracts as being, you know, people often say that this uh, area is uh, basically about money, um, but I'm a computer scientist. For me, it's basically about computation and what people can build and sort of, um, and, and the ways that people can, what, and what people can build on top of what other people have built. Um, I sort of think of it as a vehicle for software innovation um, and building new kinds of services and, uh, and, and products. And so like smart contracts are the vehicle for that. And so I got really excited about smart contracts as soon as I, um, as soon as like the idea crossed, um, crossed my, one of my feeds and um, started like looking at how it was gonna work. And it was clear that there was a really significant scaling problem. So like even today, you can think of Ethereum as basically being like a global, it's a virtual computer that's globally shared among all of the users of Ethereum. And so all of the DAP, all of the applications, all of the dApps that run on top of Ethereum have to share this single virtual computer. So like how, how big and fast is this computer that everyone in the world is supposed to share? The answer is its capacity is about a 10th of a laptop. Um, now that obviously is not going to cut it if you aspire to providing um, computing services and applications to, uh, you know, a large proportion of the humans in the world. A single tenth of a tenth of a single laptop is not going to be anywhere near enough. So it seemed obvious, at least to me, from um, even before smart contracts were sort of out there in the market, that this scaling question is going to be a big deal. How could you get? How could you have something that scaled like AWS, but actually was um, running on a blockchain? Um, that was kind of the long-term vision. That was the question. And it was clear that you weren't going to do it with the architectures that people were proposing at the time, which were basically sort of um, the idea of having a virtual computer and every node in the whole world um, just emulates that single computer. 
that was not going to cut it. And the question is, how can you do not only better than that, but like asymptotically better than that as the number of participants scales? Um, and that was sort of the problem that I posed for myself and for my students, um, you know, back in early 2014. And that's where the original idea of Arbitrum, um, what's now called optimistic roll-up um, scale up scaling uh, came from. Interesting. Um, so also I'm curious, um, there seems to be uh, several uh, roll-up solutions, right? Um, yeah. Like uh, optimistic uh, and ZK. Mm -hmm. um, can you discuss like the kind of the um, design space of uh, the mechanism yeah. for roll-up design and why do you guys uh, decide to go down the path of optimistic? Uh, optimistic. Yeah, yeah. So the first thing is that like with the roll-up design, the basic idea is that you take the call data, the sort of input data of transactions that describes what the transactions are and you store that on in a trusted place and for Ethereum-based rollups, that means that that data is written to the Ethereum chain as call data. Um, and that is relatively expensive, but it's not as expensive as Ethereum because you do batching and compression of that data, but still, um, anyway, you store that data on Ethereum and now you have off-chain mechanisms which uh, that take care of the execution of those transactions and maintain the storage of those transactions. That is kind of the state of a chain. So the Arbitrum chain is a separate chain. The inputs to that chain are written onto Ethereum so everyone can get them whenever they want. That, that input data is all fully available. And the execution of the chain is, a determ is deterministic. So that if you know the input data, you can, uh, you can compute for yourself what the result is. Okay, so you might say, okay, great, we're done. Um, we now have a scheme by which every honest person can compute the result of the chain, figure out what the current state of the Arbitrum chain is. Everyone will know it. All honest people will know it and you're done. Problem is there's one entity in the world that doesn't know it and that is the Ethereum chain, um, right? Ethereum doesn't know what has happened on this Arbitrum chain because although you can compute the, what we call the state transition function, that's the function that takes the next piece of input and grinds on it to update the chain state and maybe produce some blocks, um, some, arb some layer two blocks. Although you can compute it, Ethereum can't because Ethereum is only a tenth of a laptop, right? It doesn't have the capacity that you have. And so you need to settle these transactions, this state back to, L back to layer one. Put it another way, everyone in the world who's honest knows and agrees on what the state of the layer two chain is, but how can you prove to Ethereum what the state of the layer two chain is without just asking Ethereum to execute all the, the whole chain, the whole layer two chain itself. The whole point of this layer two is so that Ethereum doesn't have to execute everything. So you need to, you wanna to prove to Ethereum what the result of execution is without having Ethereum do the execution. And there are basically two main approaches to that. There's the optimistic approach, and then there's, this, there's the ZK proof approach. So the optimistic approach is the one we use. And the way this works basically is someone posts on Ethereum a claim about what the, about what the correct state is, and they stake on that claim. So they're going to lose that stake if the protocol decides that they lied, right? And then one of two things happens. Either a period of time passes that we call the challenge period, and no one challenges that, that claim. If so, the, uh, the layer two accepts it. Uh, if so, Ethereum accepts it, and, and this becomes the certified state of the layer two chain, right? So, but alternatively, if someone thinks that claim is wrong, if anyone in the world thinks that claim is wrong, they can post a competing claim and stake on that. And now you have uh, what we call a challenge, where two parties have made inconsistent claims about what the correct outcome of execute of, of a deterministic computation is. And then we have a dispute resolution protocol, which is going to resolve that dispute. And it can do that very efficiently. There's a bunch of really cool technology there, but I'm going to set that to the side for now because I've been this explanation has gone on long enough. But let me set aside that. Just let's let me just postulate that there is a very efficient way of resolving the dispute and identifying who's lying. So 
If someone does challenge it, we'll identify the liar, we will prune off their claim, and then the other claim will be left standing. So you can have many people make claims, there's a bunch of challenges, you prune off all the incorrect ones, and the correct one gets accepted. That's the optimistic protocol. The thing is that when you have these challenges and so on, it's because someone lied, and they lied knowing that by lying, they would lose a big stake. And therefore the incentive of everyone is to not lie. So you have a, with an optimistic protocol, it's called optimistic, not because we hope it's correct, because the protocol is guaranteed to get a correct result. Um, because it's called optimistic because we hope people are not stupid. You will get the correct result regardless. You'll get it very cheaply and efficiently if people follow their incentives. And if people don't follow their incentives, it's a little bit more expensive. Um, and then the people who didn't follow their incentives, well, they, they regret it. Um, so that's the optimistic approach, right? So in the common case, you have, in the, you have a claim about the outcome, a challenge period passes, the claim is accepted. And for the last nine months, that has happened every single time on our mainnet chain, right? There's never been a dispute on our chain, on the mainnet chain. We have had a bazillion disputes in testing We've done it on test nets deliberately and so on. And we, you know, we do it every day. We spend more cycles on testing challenge scenarios um, than on anything else. All right, but that's optimistic. The other approach is a ZK proof approach. And there what you do is essentially a very fancy cryptographic proof um, using something called usually a snark or stark, if you know what that is. Um, it's a very complicated cryptographic proof that the outcome of some execution is correct. And that has the advantage that the proof can be checked and verified very quickly and with, with confidence, which means that an Ethereum contract can verify the proof of correctness. So that's a proof of correctness rather than a sort of assertion and challenge kind of approach. It is the advantage that you get the solution faster. You don't have to wait for this challenge period. It has the enormous disadvantage that it's hugely expensive and not actually practical in real life. Uh, which is why we don't do it. So this ZK proving approach is, is practical for some limited applications. If you wanna make a chain that just does simple transfers or that just does one thing, and you're willing to like be, do, be a hero programmer and like program the heck out of that thing, as long as the thing isn't too expensive and you're willing to spend huge amounts of expert programming time writing this in like newly constructed exotic programming languages and so on then you can have sort of single purpose um, ZK, um, sort of, Z, sort of so-called ZK rollups, but a general purpose ZK rollup that's compatible with Ethereum and, um, and actually does the proofs instead of just saying, oh, we'll add the proofs later, that doesn't exist. So basically the reason is, the reason we chose our approach is that it was the thing that allowed us to deliver a product that actually has security and to do it, um, you know, and actually do it at scale. Um, People say ZK systems are gonna be great in the future. Um, I'll believe it when I see it. I think there is an inherent big cost advantage to doing things by the optimistic approach. So like, you know, we would switch if we believed or if there comes a time in the future, we believe that ZK technology is better, we'll switch. Um, but I don't think that's gonna happen. I think ZK systems have a large constant factor cost disadvantage compared to optimistic and that that's permanent. But anyway, that's why. Awesome. So thank, thank you. you. Tell, that's like a well-practiced rant. Yeah. Um, the the short version of it is ZK systems are the uh, uh, are the solution of the future and always will be. Yeah. Thank you for the for the answer. Um, that's great. Um, so I, uh, I saw some uh, hands up um, from our student. Um, I'll let uh, Andy unmute yourself. Hey there, Ed. Thanks for uh, thanks for giving this talk. Uh, so I had a question on staking. Is is there like an essential need to be staking? Because you said that on the main net, there's no disputes right now. And so if there's no disputes, there's no need to stake, right? So like, what is the network's need for stakers? Yeah, so there is, there is a party, there is one party who makes a claim about what the correct outcome is, and that party has to stake. So there's one staker. There's one party actually staked all the time. And that party makes multiple claims that kind of are sort of pipelined in the computer science lingo. Um, but there's a single stake that covers all of those. 
So the normal condition is one party is staked and there's a bunch of other parties who are watching and they're prepared to jump in with the stake if the if the uh, or if the that first party it tries to do something funny but the normal situ situation is one party stake so yeah we don't need a huge amount of stake we don't need a huge number of stakers normally there's only one and those okay. stake, the stakes are in eth so um, we don't have a special token for staking or for paying for gas or any of that okay and so is the staker the one staker right now currently the off chain labs team or yeah, we're the, we are the one. We are the one who currently is playing that role, um, but someone else could do it. Okay, and then there's no economic incentives unless someone's being dishonest, right? Like you don't just get like APY for just staking. So eventually, um, and, and we'll be rolling this out in the future. There will be parties who are paid to be validators, which means to either stake or just to watch and check everything. And some of those parties will be paid. They'll basically get a, 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 a little slice of transaction fees. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Andy. Uh, next is Gaurav. Hey, hey, thanks for taking the time today. Um, my question is twofold. One, uh, what, do you, what do you think about ETH2? And it has been delayed for four years, but like that's definitely one thing. Like that's around the corner, always around the corner. Secondly, yeah. how, how do you think, or like what kind of mental model would you recommend someone thinking about uh, like layer two solutions, Arbitrum, yeah. and uh, like other chains like Solana, like Solana is, scales well, but like it has one its issues on like, you know, going down. So yeah. I uh, would love to get a thought on both of these. Sure. Yeah, let me talk about ETH2 first. Um, I sort of see a couple of important things coming along, right? The first one that's gonna happen is the merge, which is the switch to proof of stake. Um, which is, I think is super important. It doesn't affect us as layer two um, parties that much directly. I think it's very good for Ethereum to do this. And so like, you know, we support it strongly, uh, but just because it's good for Ethereum and therefore, you know, we think it's good for the whole community. After that, what comes after that? The other, the other reason, you know, we wanna see that happen as soon as is pot responsible is that there's a bunch of things after the merge in Ethereum's roadmap that we're really eager to see. Um, and the biggest one is the rolling out of what um, Vitalik Buterin calls the roll-up centric roadmap for Ethereum. And this is the idea that Ethereum is not going to be trying, to, that Ethereum will be trying to become a complement to roll-ups. What that means is providing two main services. One is data availability, providing a lot, the, the ability of rollups to post a lot of data at, at reasonable cost. So Ethereum will focus on providing data, uh, reliable data availability, and then also becoming a settlement layer, meaning that rollups can have their protocols, which are anchored in Ethereum like ours is. The, we have smart contracts that manage this whole sort of staking and uh, claiming and challenge protocol. Um, as well as enforce some other things rooted in Ethereum, but that Ethereum is not going to is not going to try to be the primary vehicle for scaling up execution and the storage of execution state. That that would be rollups, um, and so there's a bunch of changes coming post the merge, which are going to support that. The biggest one is the so-called dunk sharding, which is basically a sort of data sharding approach, which is going to um, add a lot of data capacity to Ethereum. And we're really eager to see that happen. Um, the other one is, the other quest, part of your question is, how do I think about, or how, how might one think about the relationship between Ethereum-based layer twos or rollups versus things like Solana, which, are, which, which I think of as alt L1s. Yeah. Um, so I think those solutions are attractive in, at the moment, in some respects, the way I think about the trade-off between some, between alt L1s and Ethereum is um, I think it's useful to think about um, the sort of a sort of triangle of features that you would want, which are decentralization, security, and scalability. And so um, this has sometimes been called the um, blockchain trilemma, but it's not like a classic trilemma. Trilemma means like you can only have two of the three. Um, and I think it was the case, it was a trilemma in the past, but it's not anymore. 
Um, but I'll get to that in a minute. So Ethereum optimized for decentralization and security and made choices that valued those things over scalability. So many of the Alt L1s have chosen scalability at some cost to security or decentralization. That's basically the way that they trade those things off, right? And the reason I think Ethereum made the right choice is that is because of layer twos. Because with a layer two, you can add scalability if you already have decentralization and security, but you can't really add security by putting a layer two on top of something that's not secure. And you can't add decentralization by putting a layer two on top of something that's centralized, right? So Ethereum implemented at layer one, the things that need to be built in at the base. And so this roll-up centric roadmap, I think is the right way to get all three of those parts of the blockchain, former, the former blockchain trilemma. Um, but I don't think there's a way to get from, if you have an L1 that sacrificed um, security or decentralization, I don't think there's a way to add a layer that gives you those things back. So I sort of think of those layers as having a temporary advantage until rollups are like fully delivered. But I think the time when roll up, when the rollup um, potential is fully delivered is um, arguably uh, either already or else uh, very soon. Um, because you're gonna see rollups that in practice, um, Ethereum based rollups that um, in practice have many times the throughput of Ethereum. Um, and, and I think the first one of those will be our Arbitrum Nitro um, stack, which is on testnet right now and it's gonna be on um, and is going to be on mainnet. We're not saying a date yet because we like are really big on not saying a date um, unless we're certain that we can deliver the product on that date. Um, but we're not saying a date for this, but you know, you can go look at the uh, test net and kick the tires. It's been super solid. Um, we, um, so we, we will, I think once we migrate our current um, um, Arbitrum one chain onto the Nitro stack, then we'll really have delivered a rollup that has many times the throughput of Ethereum as well as compatibility. So, you know, then you're well down the road to having all three, um, all three um, vertices of that former trilemma. Makes sense. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Gaurav. Um, next, we have Aaron. Hi, Ed. Thanks for coming to talk with us today. Uh, good to see you again. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about you know, this topic of sort of state and blockchain in general. Yeah. So when you have any sort of blockchain, it has some sort of state on the chain. And you know, as you talked about earlier with Arbitrum, you know, you're essentially using the chain and using that state to validate what's going on on the L2. Uh, but the L2 has a state as well, right? And in your case, I guess there's the concept of virtual machines in your white paper where it's kind of like each virtual machine on the L2 has a state. And you know, very quickly, we have a lot of states running around, right? And then there's, of course, the Solana state, and then there's the state on the other L2s and, yeah. and, and, and. And. Um, and so we have protocols like the graph that sort of try to index state. But I think one of the questions that's always been on my mind is when you look back at web two or web one, a lot of what makes those tick is that there's a shared state that anybody can access anything. And here it's tricky because if I deploy a smart contract on Arbitrum, then you know how do I pull state off a different chain or off the L1 or even off a different Arbitrum VM? Um, and so I guess it leads to sort of some technical questions around development in cross-chain bridges and there's a design space there and it also leads to sort of an adoption challenge that you know how do i get people to use a particular vm in my l2 so that things talk to each other and i just i'd love to know your thoughts on that whole general part of the crypto space so there's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of pieces to that is right yeah. <laughs> with one you, you asked how do you make state available to people um, and 
to make state available to like regular people and their machines, that is not to other blockchains, but to, to clients, um, uh, the answer is basically to be compatible with how Ethereum does it, okay. which is what we do, right? You can make the same calls to an Arbitrum node that you would make to an Ethereum node to get state or to run, um, or to run non-mutating um, read-only um, code on, on the chain. Um, and of course, you can run a node yourself if you want to do that, and you know your node will sync itself and, and all of that stuff. So, like making sure that that those cap capabilities are available um, is part of it. Um, so, but there's a few other pieces to this, right? One is the piece about how do chains find out about what's happening on other chains, um, and the answer there um, partly boils down to questions about trust. Um, typically. Um, there are circumstances where one chain can fully trust another chain, but typically chains are not going to trust each other. And you're going to have a situation where um, you have a cross chain call, which is in some ways not unlike a remote procedure call on, on the internet, right? Um, you send a call from one place to another, it carries data. And the caller is you know, claiming that that data is reasonable and makes sense. And maybe it's making some claim about what it means or where it came from. But um, you do have to think about, um, about trust boundaries. You can't erase trust boundaries in this way. Um, Cross-chain bridging is all about when can one chain conclude that another chain is in some state without additional security assumptions, right? So if I'm using some chain, I'm making some security assumption. Like if I'm using Ethereum, I'm assuming that um, a majority of Ethereum miners are, um, a, a majority of Ethereum mining power is honest. Um, and, but I don't want to make some assumption, have to make some assumption about, say, Solana validators in order to have my Ethereum um, call operate correctly. And that means that a cross-chain call from Solana is going to have to be verifiable within the terms of Ethereum's trust assumptions. And like you say, there's a whole interesting design um, space there. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing. Like, how does this going to work? The other thing that you talked about is like having multiple in our initial paper, we said virtual machines are running and sort of on the same uh, chain. But nowadays, we would think about it as having multiple chains or sort of layer three kind of um, arrangement where um, you can imagine that you have a layer two chain, you have an arbitrum chain, and that people can have sort of sub chains that branch off from there. Um, because it because really, um, a chain is just in some ways kind of like a virtual machine that people can send queries to, right? Um, and so I think you're going to have more complicated multi-chain and cross-chain and sort of layered and recursive chains and so on. And how that space um, plays out is a matter of research. And, you know, we've been thinking a lot about how to do it. And we have some thoughts about how we think it should go. We're not really ready to roll anything out yet. Um, I think it's a super important problem because in order to scale, you need to scale up how much you can do in one node and on one chain. But ultimately, the demand is going to grow faster than the performance of any one chain can. And so you're going to need to have a multi-chain future. And the question is, how do you build a user experience on top of that that, um, that isn't terrible? And you might think, well, you know, it's impossible to build a, a, a decent user experience with a, you know, on a large scale across trust boundaries. But in Web 2, you know, we kind of, it kind of works in that sense. It's like, it's not nirvana, but it actually is pretty good and solves most of the problems most of the time. And I think we're gonna get there in the web three space too, but it's gonna take some evolution. This didn't happen on web two on day one, right? Back in 1993, um, this, uh, this stuff didn't really exist on web two, um, but now it does. And I think we're gonna get there in web three as well, but there's a bunch more research to figure it out. Cool, yeah, thank you. And then. I guess one related question, which is you know, sort of at the start of Arbitrum, you're in this environment where things are largely on Ethereum mainnet, and now you need to convince people, hey, 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 come over to my rollup. And you know, obviously you can say, yes, I'm gonna have lower gas fees, but how do you drive adoption for getting that first person to say, I'm gonna go to a chain that doesn't actually have a shared state? Um, well, we do have a shared state. It's not the same state as Ethereum. So here's the thing. Before we even did that, we needed to convince venture capitalists that we would be able to sell this to users and developers. 
right? Um, and so that, that was like the first hurdle, right? And so we basically came in and said, look, um, our thesis is that Ethereum gas is going to become a very scarce resource and therefore the price of it is going to go up and people are going to feel pain. And we're going to be able to provide the same functionality compatibly and, and but using much less layer one gas. So now the question is, can you convince them? And that works okay if people buy the thesis that Ethereum gas is going to become a very scarce resource. It's easy to explain why if Ethereum gas is very scarce, it will be expensive because you know, that's basically how the economics of Ethereum work. So how could we convince people that Ethereum gas is gonna become scarce? The answer is basically with graphs. Um, you show the gas use, number one, um, and how it's been growing over time and growing exponentially and faster than the gas limit. And so like these, this can't continue, number one. And number two, you just put up all these quotes from like different um, high profile companies saying we wanna scale our Ethereum based services to you know, a million users, 10 million, 100 million users. And you say, look, it's serving X number of users today. If you're gonna to get to that number of users, you're going to hit your head on this ceiling. Um, and so we convinced people of that. Um, so th that was step one, we got some money and we could then like actually hire a team and build the thing. Um, we then like worked a bunch on product market fit. And um, the real challenge there was figuring out how to become, and what the market told us is that low fees are great, but you have to be basically 99.9% .9 compatible with Ethereum, not just with EVM code, but your nodes need to be compatible with EVM nodes so that people can take commodity wallets, commodity development tools and so on, and just point them at your URL and it'll just work. Like take your MetaMask wallet, pull down the network thing and to Arbitrum, and without MetaMask doing any more than putting Arbitrum into that, um, into that pull down, um, have MetaMask work with your, your chain. So like very high level of compatibility. And what that meant was the switching cost was low, right? So we didn't need to convince a dev team to devote like three person months to porting their thing to Arbitrum that we wanted you to be able to do it in an afternoon. And in fact, when we were trying to build early on, when we were trying to sell this, our favorite trick was to uh, talk to a dev team and say, hey, you know, it would, it would only take an afternoon to port your, your, uh, your application to, uh, to Arbitrum. And they're like, yeah, right, we've, we've heard this from everybody. And we're like, no, really, Bob here did it yesterday. And here's the URL, um, put, we'll put it in the chat. And so we like put the URL in the chat, we ported their thing, you know, it's a closed thing. We're not gonna offer their product without their, their permission, but you know, this worked great. So making the switching cost really low turned out to be, to be the key to this. So people could try it at a very low cost and in investment. It felt familiar and they didn't need to rewrite their applications and, and so on. Um, and that was really key to getting people, getting a few people to jump into the water. Um, and then from there, you build the network effect, right? And the thing about network effects is they're really hard to get going, but once they get going, they become really powerful, right? When you have support from all the major wallets, when you have support from the tools and development teams, and when you have you know, on-ramps from, when you have multiple different fast bridge companies and the graph is running and um, chain link oracles are running and um, you know, all the different sort of DeFi uh, Legos are there um, and you have direct on-ramps from and off-ramps from most of the major centralized exchanges and all that stuff you get that network effect, then it becomes easier and easier. The more people are on the platform, the more companies and services and integrations, the easier it is to get the next one. So we recognize pretty early on that getting over that, getting that network effect going was really key. Um, and the key, to, the key to breaking sort of that barrier was to make switching costs super low. Um, that was not easy to do from an engineering standpoint. We probably spent, like six to nine months of engineering um, time of the whole team just on driving down those costs. But that's when we hit really felt we had product market fit is when the switching costs got really low. And that's when it really took off. Cool, okay, that was really helpful, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, next, uh, Sion. 
Uh, yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Uh, we actually met at ETH Denver a couple months ago, but it's good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, so I have three questions which are kind of related to each other. Um, when you look like two to five years into the future, uh, do you think with all the advancements that Ethereum is going, uh, undergoing right now, do you think any dApps will be built on the base layer um, is my first question. Mm -hmm. And then my second question is like in two to five years, if Ethereum is able to clear all sort of the milestones that they're, uh, they kind of promised, do you, what role do you see like other L1s such as Solana playing in that world? Yeah. So I think in the future, if we go farther into the future, most of the dApps and most of the activity will be on L2s or L LNs. Um, there will be some things that are still on the base layer, things that um, don't use much gas, mm -hmm. but um, want to have the highest availability or the sort of most cross-chain, um, mm -hmm. um, the most sort of cross-chain agility. Um, also, I think you're going to see a lot of sort of architectures where there's a headquarters and branch offices. And like the headquarters, which is small, sort of sits on L1 and branch offices sit on L2s or the other way around. Right. Uh, you're seeing a lot of cases where it's not just the same DAP launched on multiple chains, but it's like an explicitly multi-chain structure. Um, and I think those things are going to have branch offices on the L1. Not a lot of traffic going through those L1 branch offices, or if you like headquarters, um, but uh, but things may be based there. Okay. And then, do you see Solana, Cardano, all these other L1s being a big part of that sort of cross-chain ecosystem, or do you think it'll be uh, built all built on top of Ethereum? I think it's. I, I don't. I think they will have a role, but I think things are going to tip toward Ethereum-based solutions. Basically, for the reasons I said before, that the, right. the drawbacks of Ethereum are solvable in the way that um, the drawbacks of the others are not as much. There'll be things <laughs> that are on these other chains because, um, because they launched there. Um, or you may also see some specialized chains, I think, especially from some of the ZK um, type systems, you're going to see some specialized, essentially specialized chains. Mm -hmm. Custom engineered for particular applications, um, right? But I think more of the center of gravity is going to move to Ethereum, and, or to the to the Ethereum stack, if you will. Okay, and just just to tag on to that question, uh, in a world where a lot of the DApps or the majority of the DApps are being built on L2s or LNs, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of activity going on in you know LNs, do you see like the usage or the demand for Ethereum? the actual cryptocurrency, ETH, to still be as high as we've seen previously? Or like, would the demand for those tokens go down and will it most likely be, um, yeah. you know, will most of the activity be kind of constrained in the LN tokens? I mean, we'll see. The one thing that is true of Ethereum is it becomes, is it, it is valuable and liquid on, on basically all of the Ethereum based chains. Right. Um, right. So, um, you know, if we, if we were to launch an Arbitrum token, there'd probably be a lot of them on our chain and on L1, would there be a lot of them on other L2s? Um, maybe not. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think you will see the other thing that could happen is rather than ETH being, and ETH will be in demand because, um, because uh, Ethereum gas is still going to get used, okay, um, right? That all of these L2 and LN systems are going to have some non-zero footprint on Ethereum, right? Um, and that means people are going to want to buy Ethereum gas, okay, um, right? And Ether used for that. I mean, but the question is kind of what becomes the sort of main reserve currency, if you will, on the Ethereum on Ethereum stack chains, and it could be Ether, it could be some stable coin. Um, okay. I think that's especially true if like the U.S. Treasury issues a digital dollar mm -hmm. um, that is that is homed on one of these chains. I think there's a chance that that becomes the sort of um, the 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 reserve currency is sort of the ultimate um, the ultimate source of value on these chains rather than ETH. Okay. Um, and in that case, there's maybe less demand for ETH. ETH will still be valuable. Um, it'll still because it'll be it is the native currency of the L1 chain and it will be the native 
Because of that, it will be the native currency of other chains, including ours. Mm -hmm. um, we've said that ETH, what, so ETH is our native currency and ETH will continue to be our native currency on our tech um, going mm -hmm. And do you see gas prices with all kind of the role of technology and advancements going on? Do you see gas prices going down in the future or, or still like with the amount of expansion going on in LNs, the gas prices will still yeah, um, Ethereum gas prices are going to be, there's like different ways of looking at this. One is like, what is the price of your transaction in gas? Mm -hmm. um, how much do you have to pay for a single transaction on an LN? Um, right. You know, what is sort of your amortized share of the um, L1 Ethereum gas? Um, and that could be quite, that could become very small, but in aggregate, as you scale up the amount of activity, that'll still add up to a lot of Ethereum a lot of Ethereum gas being purchased. Mm -hmm. So the price of Ethereum gas may not go down, but the amount of gas that your individual LN transaction um, has to account for um, is likely to go down. Okay. Thank um, you so much, Ed. Yeah. As an example, like Ethereum is going to massively scale up its data capacity. Um, the price per byte of that is going to go down a lot, but the sort of aggregate collections of data of data gas on Ethereum uh, may well be, uh, will probably be higher than it was before. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. So more gas consumed, but also the, and, and the gas limit going up a lot. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Siang. Uh, we um, received actually a question um, from the um, chat. Like he can um, mute himself, but the question uh, from Dominic is, uh, what is your view on the future of the user experience? for um, ranging from uh, L1 to L2, especially in light of the rollout centric uh, roadmap of Ethereum versus uh, onboarding the next X million users. Yeah, I mean, two pieces of this are um, the, the question of how is it that users are going to get onto or get funds on L2 chains. Um, one way to do it is certainly is to bridge from L1. Um, and we've been working, you know, we have a user experience team and we're working on the user experience around bridging. Um, there, you know, there is some friction there because it is a step you have to do in order before you can use an L2 chain. Um, but we're working on the friction there. But, but I think you're going to increasingly see direct on-ramps and off-ramps. So as an example, um, many of the largest centralized exchanges have direct on-ramps and off-ramps to Arbitrum. So um, Binance, Wobi, FTX, Crypto.com, um, they have on-ramps and off-ramps. If you want to get ETH and some other tokens um, on and off, you can do that directly. So a user could be fully Arbitrum native in the sense that they, <coughs> they, um, that they hold their assets either in a centralized exchange or move between that centralized exchange directly to and from an, um, the Arbitrum 1 chain. Um, so I think that becomes a big part of it. Um, those things in the fiat on ramps, the you know buy ETH or buy tokens with your credit card kind of services, those providing direct deposit onto L2. I think I think that's going to be um, that's going to be what a lot of users users use rather than saying I'm going to come into Ethereum, then I'm going to bridge to L2. They're going to say I'm going to come straight into this L2 chain. The other thing that I think you're going to see is you're going to see application developers figuring out ways to give their, their users um, direct on-ramps or the ability to do experience without going through a generic onboarding, right? The generic onboarding is you go to a centralized exchange, you buy some ETH, um, you set up an L1 wallet, which is like a kind of a hassle for people who aren't, um, uh, who aren't um, you know, super experienced um, using, uh, using web technologies. Then you have to go through a bridge and bridge to L2. I think a lot of that stuff is going to go away and it's going to be easier to just like interact directly with um, applications to get done the user experience that users want without worrying so much about this stuff. Thank you. Uh, Andy? Hey. Uh, Ed. So yeah, I, I had one more question. I was looking at the, the sequencer documentation and I know it says it's, it's currently centralized, but there's a plan to eventually have uh, independent parties. What does that end game look like? Are you trying to involve just like a full decentralized network where there's just random people or do you want more kind of firms and, and how much yeah, does that so actually matter? Let me, let me talk about how that works. Um, so the sequencer is a component in our system whose only job is to 
put users' transactions into, well, as, the, as the name would suggest, into a sequence. So it doesn't have the ability to manufacture transactions and it can't censor transactions. Its only power is, is limited power to uh, establish what is the, what is, how does the chain order the transaction? So your wallet, when you submit a transaction will connect directly or indirectly to the sequencer. And currently we run the sequencer, it's centralized and it follows a first come first serve policy, right? Which we think is the, the fairest way to do it. But the roadmap calls for decentralizing that. So what does that mean? It still means first come first serve, but what it means is that instead of a single centralized sequencer, there's a committee of sequencers and um, sequencing is done by consensus of that committee. So you, your transaction gets sent to all the committee members. And if your transaction arrives before mine at a super majority of those committee members, then your transaction will be before mine in the order. Um, so it's a sort of collective process. So it's not, it's not a scheme where those committee members take turns and each one is like the, it's not what, what I call serial centralization, which is like how most proof of work and proof of stake schemes work, which is that uh, like you pick one party by, um, by some randomish process and that party gets to be king for a king for one block and just does whatever they want. It's not that sort of serialized, serial centralization. What it is, is a, a committee of sequencers. Each one publishes their own sequence of what they say is the first come first served order. And then there's a fair merge algorithm of those sequences. And so the consequence of that is if a suitable majority of the sequencers are honest, then that merge, then the result of this process will be fair meaning that if yours arrives before mine at a supermajority of the sequencers, then yours will be before mine in the final order. It's kind of the distributed, the suitable distributed definition of what first come first serve means. So that's what the roadmap is. Um, so, but that means having a defined committee of sequencers. That is, you know, there'll be like 15 or 21 of them or something like that, um, that are, will be chosen by some means. Initially we'll choose them, but we want to move toward having a, having a community-based um, way of, of choosing those, those members. Okay. So full decentralization means that committee-based scheme technically, and then a, a decentralized scheme for choosing them. Awesome, thank you, Andy. So I'm almost out of time, but I'll let uh, Gaurav ask the last question. Hey, Ed, uh, thanks again for hopping on the call. Uh, Arbitrum is, is like a pretty interesting layer and like it comes with the scaling and privacy that you talked about. So what are some interesting use cases you would see built on Arbitrum as we move forward? Um, well, so the first answer is all the things that are built on Ethereum basically are, um, are built and can be built on, on Arbitrum. The lower gas cost means and the higher scalability means that you can have applications that are more compute hungry. And so that, um, and those do exist in the DeFi space. There are categories of applications, especially relatively complex um, market making and order book matching type of algorithms. Um, those can become feasible and um, um, on, um, on a chain like Arbitrum. Um, there's also, it's also the case that you can do a lot of the same things, but um, at lower value. So if you look at some th things like DeFi applications, if it costs $40 on Ethereum to do a transaction, you know, that puts a minimum on the amount of funds and the amount of value that you can, you can have in that transaction, right? You're not gonna trade, do a $20 value trade with the $40 fee. Um, so as you drive that cost down, you can really democratize access to and participation in a lot of things that already existed. But as we drive um, scale up and cost down through things, through things that are farther on a roadmap, I think a bunch of new categories of applications come in. So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in gaming, um, bringing gaming type of applications in. A lot of those are hungry for computation or they require the kind of response time that Arbitrum can give, which is typically less than a second from submitting a transaction until you have back a result. 
Um, that's a big part of the value proposition, especially for gaming type of applications that we haven't really talked about. It's an interesting thing we set out to basically to solve scaling, but one of the things we figured out along the way is that the things we designed for scaling could actually also provide super low response time. So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in the gaming space, um, a lot of gaming type applications, social applications, and also applications that just require enormous scale. So for example, Reddit has talked about taking their community points system and tokenizing that. Um, they have about a half billion users worldwide. Huge number of those users have these tokens. Um, Reddit is building, has, has said that they're building this on, um, on Arbitrum technology. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you just couldn't do on a chain that operated at smaller scale. Um, you know, we have to, um, you know, you have to get to our next generation of scaling stuff, which is like coming very soon, very, very soon. It's in testnet already um, in order to be able to support the kind of throughput that um, an application like that would need. But I think you're seeing some very large scale applications that come from like well-known companies in the web two space that become available once you have the, the scale that you need to serve their user population. So it's like, how do you get yeah. to a, a billion users in web three technologies? The answer, it has to be scaling. That's fascinating. Thanks, Ed. Thanks for sharing yeah. your thoughts on that. Yeah. Thank you um, so much, Ed, for coming here and uh, to our event, Stanford Blockchain Club, and share with uh, Stanford uh, students. Um, everything about Arbitrum and uh, scalability on Ethereum, I personally uh, learned a ton. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for, for your time. Thanks. And I posted in the chat um, contact information um, for Twitter, Telegram, and email. If uh, anyone wants to reach out, we're always happy to talk to folks who are building interesting things, folks who are looking for jobs or internships. Uh, we're hiring as many smart people as we can. So um, if you have any interest at all, please reach out. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Good one. All right. Bye. Bye.